Good morning. I'm going to be reading today's text, which is found in Exodus 12, 7 through 12. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts of the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted, its head with its legs and its inner parts, and you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover, for I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And all of, and all of the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. Thank you, Colin. Uh, today I have the privilege of uh, announcing or uh, introducing to you uh, a new, they're not that new, they've been coming here for quite some time, a new couple in our church, David and Michelle Gibson. David pastored in Whitesboro for a number of years. He's preached more sermons probably than I have, and so I'm delighted to introduce to you Mr. David Gibson. He's going to be preaching for us this morning. Y'all put your hands together and welcome him. Morning, church. Uh, I like to say good morning, church family. My wife and here, uh, and I've been members here for a, for a little while now. She's not here. I wish I could introduce you to her. She's in Washington State. Uh, my son-in-law is in the Navy, uh, and um, so she went up there to to visit with them. And they've got a little sailor in the oven. Uh, he's going to be here <laughs> uh, in August. So y'all keep them in, in your prayers and, and uh, pray for her for for traveling mercies. I don't do well when I'm batching by myself. When this service is over, or the when church is over this morning, I gotta go home and clean the house because she's coming back, all right? So um, anyway, um, uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity, Jason, to, to share a word from the Lord with, with y'all this morning. And um, uh, I just wanna say that I appreciate Jason. I um, appreciate his leadership here. And so if you appreciate your pastor, I hope you pray for him every week. If you appreciate your pastor, would you give him a round of applause this morning? Also, uh, I really appreciate our worship leaders who come week after week so prepared and they bring us before the throne of God, ready to worship, ready to receive God's word. If you appreciate our worship leaders, would you give them a round of applause this morning? You guys do a great job. All right, so we read this morning from Acts chapter 12. And last week we had our um, uh, communion service. It was a great service, wasn't it? Uh, it was just a great holy time, a time that I really felt the presence of the Lord in our, in our, in our midst. And Jason kind of set up um, my message for this week by doing that because he, he, uh, he took us back to Exodus chapter 12 and, and related that uh, to, to communion, the Lord's Supper, and, and uh, the original Passover. And so... I don't have to go rehash all that for this week. Just to say, to sum it up, to say that God's judgment had been handed out. His, his wrath on sin was coming. There was death and destruction on the way. And the only way to escape it was to be hid behind the blood of a perfect sacrifice. And so we find in this group of people that we read about in Exodus chapter 12, a, one of the very first pictures in Scripture of the church. Because what are we? Aren't we a people who have been made safe from death and destruction because we're hid behind Jesus Christ, our perfect sacrifice? We're hid behind his blood. It's the only thing that protects us. It's the only thing that's, that saves us. The Bible says that there is no other way to God but through Jesus Christ. Amen. He's the only way to salvation. And so, uh, so we see a picture uh, of, of us in these people this, in, in this um, verse that we read. And I also want to um, point to their readiness. Check out what it says there in verse, in verse 11. Verse 11 says, In this manner you shall eat it, talking about the, um, um, the, the body of the lamb that was to be roasted in fire. He said, In this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, your staff and your hand, you shall eat it in haste. It's the Lord's Passover. Notice their readiness. They were ready for something. They were a people on a mission. They knew that this wasn't all that there is. 
that there was something coming after this, that God isn't just saving them for this moment, but he's saving them for a mission. And that's what we are. We're not just the people who are waiting for the bus to come get us and take us home, but we are here on a mission while we're here. Amen? Yeah, I preach a lot better if I get some amens. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm going to turn around and give myself an amen, all right? But that's what we are. We are a people saved from death and destruction by the blood of a perfect sacrifice, Jesus Christ. And we are a people on a mission. We're ready to follow him into whatever is next. And that's what the church is. And so they are made ready by a couple of things. They're made ready, number one, by the blood that covers them and that they're hid behind. But there's another aspect of this story that I bet you've never heard preached about. I'm going to talk about that this morning. I want to talk about the fire that burned behind that blood. Notice what it says in our, in our text. It says, Then you shall take some of the blood, put it on the, the doorpost of the lintel of the house which you shall eat it. And we understand the, the importance of that that, that, that that blood protected them from the wrath that was to come. When God saw the blood, he knew a death had been paid at this, at this house. And so he can pass over it. And so when we stand before the judgment of God, he'll see the blood of his son on us, and he'll know that a death has been paid for our sins. We understand the significance of the blood. But notice this. They shall eat the flesh that night roasted in fire. I want to talk this morning about that fire because that fire was an empowering thing. The Bible says that because of that meal that they ate behind the blood, roasted in that fire, that it empowered them to go into their mission the next day. The Bible says that they left that place the next day and none of them were feeble. None of them were sick. None of them uh, had a, a, a cough. None of them had a sore throat. One million people and none of them were complaining <laughs> about not feeling good. Have you ever had 10 people in a room and none of them not complain about not feeling good? They were prepared for what God was leading them into not just by the blood that covered their door, but by the fire that was behind it. They were prepared. It was an empowering thing. Outside, and so what we learn from this group of people about us is that behind the blood of the Lamb, listen, there ought to be a fire for the Lamb. Amen? If, you're, if your heart is covered by the blood of Jesus, there ought to be a fire in your heart for Jesus. It ought to empower you to follow him into whatever is next. If you're, if you're covered in the blood of Jesus, there ought to be a fire for Jesus in your heart. Outside that night, there was darkness, but inside, there was light. Outside, there was death, but inside, there was life. Outside, there was despair, but inside, there was hope. There was a hope for a future. And so we see ourselves in them. And so what we learn from this picture is that behind the blood of the Lamb, there ought to be a fire for the Lamb. Because Jesus died for us, there ought to be in us a desire and a passion to love him and to serve him and a readiness to follow him into whatever was next. And then in Acts chapter 2, we find another picture of the church in connection with this empowering fire. In Acts chapter 2, verse 1, it says that when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. Now, Pentecost is not a scary word. Uh, it's not a religious word. Pentecost just means 50 days after Jesus had ascended into heaven. Penta means five. Pentecost means 50. So that's all that it means. So 50 days after Jesus had ascended into heaven, telling them to be ready, I'm going to send power to you. It says in verse 2, And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And then I want to draw your attention down to verse 11. Because what was going on here was there was many different nationalities um, present. And most of them spoke different languages. And so he gives a list of, of some of the different nationalities that were there. And then notice what it says in verse 11. Both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues, what were they telling? The mighty works of God. And so we know this story very, very well. The Spirit of God came like a mighty rushing wind, and the Bible says that, that tongues like fire set on the heads of each one that was, that was there. And so what was the purpose of this fire? 
the time had come for the gospel of Jesus Christ to start going out worldwide. And that day at Pentecost was the beginning of it. It was the beginning of the gospel going out from the church. And then, like there always is, there was a challenge to that gospel being spread. The challenge was that many different nationalities were represented, and most of them spoke a different language than what the disciples spoke. But on that day, the Holy Spirit, the fire was present to enable them to overcome that challenge. And the miracle of Pentecost wasn't that people spoke in languages they didn't know. The miracle of Pentecost was that the lost heard the gospel of Jesus Christ and believed it and were saved by it. Amen? That's the, that was the... That was the miracle of Pentecost, and it's still the same miracle today. See, each of us are to be have a readiness in us. Each of us, we're, we're not just saved. And it, Jesus doesn't just save us and says, okay, you sit right here until I come and take you home. Jesus saves us with a purpose. He says, you, you look for every opportunity that I want to put in your path to tell somebody else about what I've done for you. Jesus died and was buried and, was buried and raised to life again for you. And all he wants you to do is to tell everybody you have an opportunity about that. Amen? That's our job. We need to have a readiness to do that. And so, like, and just like back then, there's always going to be a challenge to it. There's always going to be some challenge that the enemy is going to be sure and put in your way to make sure that you fail at spreading the gospel to those around you. But listen, the Bible says that we have been given a fire from heaven to overcome every challenge of his gospel. Some of, you, some of you may be looking at yourself and going, I think that fire skipped me. <laughs> I think that fire bypassed me. I don't think it set on my head, but I want you to notice what our scripture said. The Bible said that that fire set on how many of them? It set on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. None of them were skipped by the fire. And notice what kind of fire it is. The Bible says it was a head fire. That's important. Why did it sit on their head? Why didn't it sit on their shoulder like the, you know, the little devil on the angel that we see on cartoons? Why didn't it sit on their shoulder where they could see it? Why didn't it sit on their heart where they could see it? The Bible says it sat on their head. <laughs> why is that important? You know why? It's because you have to know it's there by faith. You know why? Because it's hard to see what's on top of your own head. <laughs> you know, there's things that you've never seen. You've never seen your own face. You've only seen a reflection of your face. What if your mirror is lying to you? You're not 100% sure what you look like. <laughs> you've never seen the back of your elbows. Listen, you've never seen with your own eyeballs the top of your head. <laughs> it, it, let's say this is my fire. I can't see it. No matter how hard I try, I can't see my own fire. Um, my kids used to play a game with cards where they would, and they would have a a name or something on it, and they'd, they'd hold it up their, to their head because they couldn't see what it was. And people would give them clues, and they'd have to try to guess what the card said. Remember when Michael Jackson was doing the Pepsi commercial and his hair caught on fire? Remember that? He was still up there. Some of y'all said, Michael Jackson, what are you talking about? Back in the 80s, there was a pretty good singer. His name was Michael Jackson, and he was doing a, pe a Pepsi commercial, and his hair caught on fire from the heat of the lights. And he was still up there dancing and moonwalking. <laughs> it's a pretty good moonwalk <laughs> for cowboy boots. And his hair caught on fire, and he didn't even know it. People had to run up and say, they, they ran up and tackled him and started beating him on the head, and he wondered, what are you doing? They said, Mike, your head's on fire. He didn't know it. You're the last one to know when your head's on fire. <laughs> you ever see those YouTube things when People's blowing out their birthday cake and their hair cuts it on fire. They're the last one to know it. And listen, it's a head fire because you have to trust in faith that God has set you on fire for a purpose. God has given you a fire in your heart to get his gospel out to those around you. You know what's easy to see other people's fire? Man, it's easy to look at Jason and see his fire. It's easy to look at these uh, our worship leaders when they're up here and see their fire, but it's hard to see your own fire. You have to believe that the fire is there. And you may think it skipped you, but listen, it says that that fire set on each of them. It skipped none of them. If you've been saved by the blood of Jesus, then you've also been given a fire for Jesus. Everyone saved by Jesus has been set on fire for Jesus for the purpose of getting out the gospel of Jesus. But let's be honest about something. 
sometimes that fire is just not what it ought to be. <laughs> right? I mean, sometimes our fire for Jesus, our enthusiasm for Jesus, our zeal for serving Jesus just isn't what it used to be or what it ought to be. Sometimes, I used to hear some preachers say, man, if that don't light your fire, your wood's wet. You ever use that one, Jason? <laughs> All right. Sometimes there's things that happen that just dampen our fire. There's things that happen that causes our fire to fade. And so this morning I want to spend a little bit of time talking about three things that, that the Bible points to. They're not things that I came up with, but they're things the Bible points to that give us a hint of some things that might dampen our fire. The first one is something called strange fire. And it comes from a very obscure passage of Scripture uh, about three places, but I want to read to you from, um, from Numbers chapter 26, verse 61. Look at what it says. It says, Nadab and Abihu died when they offered strange fire before the Lord. Strange fire. That's a kind of an odd term. What, what was this strange fire that so angered God that he killed them right before the throne? Well, in the Old Testament times, the, the priests were supposed to offer uh, a burnt incense offering. And the incense was created in such a way that it was holy and consecrated to God and to be just for use for worship in the temple. And the only fire they were allowed to use to light that incense was to come from the altar of God that burned 24 hours a day. But for some reason, that was the only fire God would accept. If you, if you were to light it with anything else, God wouldn't accept the worship. He wouldn't upset, accept the offering. But for some reason, these two priests... For whatever reason, maybe they were late that day. Maybe they just thought God wasn't watching. But for some reason, they lit that fire with something other than the fire from the altar. They lit it with a strange fire. And it so displeased God that he killed them. He burned them right there where they, where they, where they stood. And why was God so upset with them? What was the big deal? Listen, it was because they took what should only been given to God's fire and they gave it to another fire. God is not okay with it when we take what we should only be given to him and give it to something else. That's what holiness means. You're, everything about you has been made holy by the blood of Christ. And it's for one purpose, and that's to serve him and to serve the Father. But when we give our time and our energy and our resources and our devotion, our passion, even our love to other things, God counts it as a strange fire, and he's not okay with it. I got just a little bit of a... Um, demonstration I want to show you about some, maybe what, at least in my life, what strange fire has often looked like. As I get closer, I understand that I'm a spitter, so I don't have COVID, <laughs> as far as I know, but y'all are in the splash zone, so just be, be ready, all right? I can't help it. I've tried. I've just been a, I'm just a spitter, all right? But these, I got these two totes up here on either side of this table, and they represent my heart at different times in my Christian life. They're behind the blood. I want you to notice I've got some spray paint that I put on there, and that re represents the blood of Jesus. This is my heart at some stage in my life. And it's, it's in my Christian life. I've been, my heart has been covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Praise God. And so in my heart, which is what this tote represents, there ought to be a fire for Jesus in there. But there was a time in my life when God wasn't really a priority. Jesus wasn't number one in my life. Even though he's my savior, I thought, well, I've got that taken care of. I, I, I got, I, I've got him my, as my savior, but I didn't necessarily make him my Lord. Maybe other things, I gave what I should be given to God to other things, and my fire for Jesus, my passion for Jesus, my enthusiasm for Jesus began to fade. Anybody else ever been there? I'm going to pull some things out of this bucket that kind of, um, that in my life I've given too much of myself to. They've been a fire, a strange fire that burned way too brightly. Uh, how about this one? See, I've given a whole lot of myself to chasing after stuff like this. Now this one, I had to borrow this from my wife because I didn't have any, I didn't have any small enough to fit in the, bu in the bucket. So, <laughs> all right, so this one, this is not mine, but you still understand, I, 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 listen, I gave a lot of passion to this in my life. I gave a lot of love to the. You know, I used to say, boy, I love to deer hunt. <laughs> wow. And I, and I did. 
And sometimes, and, and God was okay with it until it became more important to me. That when I thought more about this, when I read more about how to do it, than, than, read, than I read his word, when I gave more money to being able to bring this home than I gave in the offering plate, it became a strange fire in my life. And it burned up way too much of my, of my, of my life. There was a story, there's a story I heard about um, you'll, uh, uh, a couple of events that happened in Yosemite National Forest or, or the, the, the park there in Yosemite. And there's two events. They're both, they both have the same name, and it's called the Firefall. And one's natural, and it happens in, in the month of February almost every year where the angle of the sun is just right, where there's a certain waterfall, and as it comes off the cliff, the sun shines through it, and it looks like that it's on fire. But then there's another one that's a man-made firefall. And what they do is the park rangers all through the year, they go through the park, and they gather up all of the fallen trees and the, and the brush um, that's a potential forest fire hazard, and they bring it to the edge of the sheer cliff, and they pile it up all year long. And then a couple of, uh, and then uh, uh, one, one day during the year, they set that brush pile on fire. And, and when it burns down to embers and it gets dark, they have a big bulldozer and they just push it over the edge of that cliff. And as it falls, it looks like a firefall. And there's a place where you can park at a safe distance away where you can see the fire as it falls. And one year they had a notice that said, the fire will not be falling this year. Somebody asked the ranger, how come the fire won't fall this year? He said, well, we had a fire before we could get all the debris cleaned up. A fire came through and burned all the fuel. And we've got nothing left for this fire fall. And what that said to me was, I, this was a pretty good picture of my life. Sometimes the fire for Jesus isn't there because I've gave too much of myself to another fire. I've got nothing left to give to Jesus. I gave a lot to that. How about this thing? Now, this is about to start, folks. Uh, Maybe there's some turkeys left. I don't know. Um, my wife says I'm a turkey. But um, this, is about to, this is about to start. And some people don't like to use decoys. They say it scares away the turkey. They spook at it. But it's because they don't deploy them the right way. They say, you know, I put it out there in front. The turkey comes in. He sees it. He runs away. But they don't use it the right way. The proper way to deploy a decoy <laughs> is like this. By the time he runs away, <laughs> you got a turkey on your head. Where? <laughs> it's hard to see a turkey on your own head. All right. Anyway, I got that. Hey, listen, this has been a big draw of my fire over the year, years. Now, I don't know if Gary Billings is in here. He says, you know, I didn't think it was that important to you in high school. It was. There he is. <laughs> All right. It was. It was important to me. It's been very important to me as a coach. It's been very important to me as a player. It's been very important to me as a father of a player. Listen, I have said things to grow men with striped, t with striped shirts on that I would never say to another human being for, any, <laughs> for anything. But I had a big passion for this, and sometimes it, I didn't have, because I had so much passion for this, I didn't have much left for God. Um, lately, um, exercises, working out has been a big thing for me. Let me get a quick, quick pump on, all right? <laughs> it's a big thing for me. Um, I put a lot, I have to be careful that I don't put too much into that. But that doesn't become a bright fire. How about this? This is, this is my tackle box. Now, if you look in, this doesn't look like much, but if you look in my boat, there's dozens of these. And you hear that? That's the sound of a $100 bill. <laughs> and there's dozens of these in my boat. Hey, we all have to work and make a living, right? All of these things, if we're not careful, if we're not careful, they can take up too much of what should be going to God. And it goes, these become bright fires in our life, right? And listen, I'm sorry this is all man stuff. If my wife was here, maybe I'd had a bucket with shoes in it, um, Amazon boxes, whatever, all right? But you just have to kind of put your own stuff in these boxes. But listen, I became convicted of the strange fire in my life. I became convicted that God says, I have given you resources, I've given you energy, I've given you time, I've given you passion, and you're giving it to other things. I'm not okay with it. This is strange fire. I want you to be devoted to me. And so I, I repented of that the best that I could, and I hope that now I'm more in line with this tote. It's still, still covered in the blood of Jesus. But 
What's the most important? What's the biggest fire that burns now? <laughs> See, now I'm committed to giving more of myself, as much of myself, all of myself to the things of God. This needs to be the biggest fire. Now listen, God, Jesus didn't say, put me only. He said, put me first. When we put him first, he tends to be the biggest. His fire tends to be the brightest. They're still, I'm still doing some of these things, but they're much smaller fires now. I'm still a deer hunter. I'm not going to quit unless God tells me to. He hasn't told me to yet, but it's a smaller fire. I'm still, I still like sports, but it's a smaller fire. It's not a strange fire anymore. It's an acceptable fire. I still like to work out. <laughs> That's more, more like it, right? Yeah, but it's not such a big fire. Um, hey, I'm still a turkey hunter, but it's not such a big fire anymore. Now, I used to think I'm saying, hey, come over here. <laughs> That's what I thought that said in turkey talk. But honestly, I think what I'm saying is repent. Turn around, go the other way, because when I do that, well, not much success. Hey, I'm still a fisherman. It's a smaller fire. I still got to work for a living, but listen, it's a smaller fire. Are you getting the picture of what I'm trying to tell you? Is that God is not okay when we take what should be, and, oh, and by the way, where's, I couldn't hardly find it, but look over here. See the difference? This is one of those little New Testament Bibles. And hey, y'all, it's not even the whole Bible. It's just the New Testament. Only half of God's Word. But you see what I'm trying to, the point I'm trying to get across is that God is not okay when we take what should be given just to Him and we give it to other things. What fires are biggest in your life? Where is the, is there strange fire or is there godly fire? And then in the second place, there, I think the Bible points to a dampener of our fire as being disappointment. Anybody ever been disappointed? You know, I used to be a, a huge um, Oklahoma City fan, <laughs> but I've been disappointed in <laughs> OKC, and my enthusiasm for watching OKC play basketball has been extinguished almost. But very often in my life, things have happened that have been great disappointments to me. I wanted things to go this way, but they went some other way. I was left to deal with the disappointment. Oftentimes, I have gotten, things have, have gone one way. I've wanted things to go a certain way in my life, but they went another way. And the bad thing is that, I, is that I know that God could have made them go my way. God could have got me that job, but he didn't. God could have healed my loved one, but instead they died. And I was left with a disappointment so deep and so profound that my fire from God had all but faded just because I knew he could have done it my way, but he did it a different way. Is God upset with me for being upset with him? Listen, when I prayed for loved ones to be healed and they died, I have to confess I was disappointed and upset with God, and my fire for him got low. Anybody else ever been there? Is God okay? Is God upset with me for that? Is God mad at me when I, when I doubt and when my, I have disappointment? Not at all. In fact, the Bible tells us about a man who Jesus called the greatest human that ever lived. And yet he had disappointments. So, so serious, in fact, that he began to doubt who Jesus said he was. It was John the Baptist. When John saw Jesus coming to be baptized, he got everyone's attention. He said, look, behold, there he is. There's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Look, that's the one I've been telling you about. He was so sure that Jesus was the one. And yet just a few verses later, we find that same John in prison for standing up for Jesus. Jesus was his cousin for crying out loud. He thought, surely Jesus is going to come and bust me out of prison. He probably had in his mind thoughts like those old Western movies where they tie the rope around the prison bars and pull the wall. He thought Jesus is going to make a dramatic jailbreak for me. He's going to get me out of here. Listen, Jesus never even showed up and gave John a visit. He never even visited John in prison. And John had to listen to all the, th the other things that Jesus was doing for other people. I want to share with you. And, and so as he listened to what Jesus did with other people's life, in his life, his fire for Jesus began to fade. I want to share with you what it says 
in uh, Luke chapter 7, verse 18. It says the disciples of John reported all these things to him. All these things Jesus had been doing for other people, they were telling John about it. And John, calling two of his disciples to him, sent them to the Lord, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And when the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And in that hour, talking about Jesus, he healed many people of diseases and plagues and evil spirits. And on many who were blind, he bestowed sight. And he answered them, Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, the poor have good news preached to them, and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. John was 100% sure this is the one. Look, everybody, that's the one. He's the one I've been telling you about. But when disappointment came, when he found himself not at the right hand of Jesus, but in jail, waiting on the axe to fall, he became disappointed. And his disappointment caused doubt until finally he said, y'all go ask Jesus, are you really the one? If you were really the one, would you leave me here in this situation? Have you ever been where John is? Questioning God, God, if you really love me, if you're really who this Bible says you are, would you have let this come into my life? Disappointment just happens, folks. But what was, what was his, what was Jesus' answer? His answer was Scripture. Remember what the Bible said. He showed him a reference to Isaiah 61. And listen, it's the same to us. We have disappointment, but God is not silent in our disappointment. In our disappointment, the Bible speaks to us. When things are the worst in your life, Remember what the Bible promises us. For we know this, that all things work together for what? For good. Um, it reminds me, you know, sometimes we, we ask, and the, and the Bible says that Jesus promised us, he said, listen, if you ask for a stone, I'll never give you a, if you ask for bread, I'll never give you a stone. If you ask for a fish, I'll make sure you don't get a serpent. And sometimes God says no because we're asking for what we think is bread, but he knows it's a stone, and so he says no. Sometimes we ask for what we think is a fish, but he knows it's a serpent, and so he says no. You remember that song that Garth Brooks had out a few years ago where he had a girlfriend that he was praying that God would make fall in love with him, and she hated him, and he, he, just, he was kind of upset with God about it for a long time, and he went to a football game 20 years later, and he saw her, and he goes, yikes. <laughs> Thank you, God, for saying no. That was a serpent, <laughs> and you said no. God knows what's best for us better than we do. And God says this, I'll make you this promise. I, have a, I know the plans that I have for you. They are all good plans to do you good and for a good future. God knows what's best. His word, he, God is not silent in our disappointment. He speaks to us in our, in our disappointment. And he speaks to our disappointment. And then finally, I think one of the things that the Bible points to that tends to dampen our fire for Jesus is shame or guilt. The truth is that none of us are perfect, and all of us, even if we've been a Christian for years and years, we all mess up. And when we do, the enemy tries to make us feel so ashamed of our sins, so ashamed of our failure, so ashamed of our mess-ups that our that our fire for Jesus begins to fade, that God is angry with us, that somehow we've got beyond his grace. And we get full of shame and guilt and it dampens our fire. I remember when I was pastoring just a few years ago, we had a, a couple in our church who always gave a 4th of July celebration. And, and on that, and they, had, they always had a big fireworks show. And I was sitting next to one of our deacons and one of the kids lit a, he was, his name was Zeke, he was lighting fireworks over on his own, and he had these little rockets, and they were shooting up in the sky, and one of them, when he lit it, fell over, and it came right between me and the deacon, and I said two words. The first one was holy, the second one was not holy, <laughs> All right. and, and that bothered me because that's been, when I was younger, that was my vocabulary, vocabulary was a struggle for me. Curse words were easy on my tongue, and I thought I had got past it. But when that rocket buzzed my ear, it all came back, and I felt such shame. 
especially since the deacon was sitting right next to me. He says he didn't hear it, but I know he did. <laughs> Everybody heard it, all right? But you know what he reminded me of? He says, listen, that was not beyond God's grace. Jesus died once for all sin, for all people, for all time. And, that, and, and so that reminds me of Peter, and I'm so thankful for the, for the life of Peter. Remember the fire that, the, that Peter had at the Lord's Supper? And he said, Lord, I'll never, I'll never deny you. If I have to die with you, I'll never deny you. And remember how that fire stayed in him even when Jesus, they came to arrest Jesus? Remember that he took that sword and cut the guy's ear off that was trying to arrest Jesus? Why did he cut his ear off? It's because he missed his head. He was trying to kill the guy. He had a fire for Jesus. And he said, this is what I'll never do. I'll never, I'll never deny you. But just a few verses later, we find Jesus being on trial and Peter doing something he swore he would never do. Listen to what it says in Luke chapter 22. It says, when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. I think it's very um, symbolic that Jesus betrayed, that, G that P Peter betrayed Jesus by a Another fire, because his own fire was getting low. Look what it says. A servant girl seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him said, This man also was with him. But he denied not it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. A little later, someone else saw him and said, You also are one of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, Certainly this man also was with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you're talking about, and catch this immediately. While he was still speaking, the rooster crowed, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered what he said, and he wept bitterly. Can you imagine the shame that must have been in Peter at that moment? I think that Peter's shame was profound. There's a pretty interesting scripture that in the book of John where it talks, John says, you know, I outran when Jesus, when we heard that Jesus was back to life, I outran John to the tomb. I outran Peter to the tomb. Peter must have been a pretty fast guy for John to brag about that. But I don't think that Peter had gotten slower. I think that Peter was on his way to the tomb, hearing that Jesus was back from the dead, began to think the last time I saw Jesus face to face. I did something I promised him I'd never do. And then I did it again. Can you identify with Peter's shame and guilt? Have you ever done something and felt so much shame because it was something you swore you'd never do or maybe never do again, but you did it? How can you face Jesus face to face on your judgment day knowing what you've done, knowing that he knows what you've done? The reason that you can have boldness to face God on your judgment day is because God is not going to judge you based on your works, but based on the perfect work of his son Jesus at the cross. How can I have boldness? How can I have confidence to leave this world and face God in my judgment day? Here's why. I want to share a scripture with you from 1 John chapter 4 and verse 17. It says, by this is love. By, by this is love per per perfected so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. That's what you want, right? You want confidence to face God on your judgment day. Where will it come from? We may have confidence for the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. I'm so thankful today that God doesn't see me. He sees the blood of his son. Listen, folks, that lights my fire. <laughs> it takes away my shame. It takes away my guilt. And so we come finally to the point where we look at the second nature of fire. The first nature of fire is to grow. And I hope that at least by what you've heard a little bit this morning, the fire in your heart has been fanned a little bit. It's been fed a little bit. And maybe it's grown a little bit. But also it's my hope and prayer that this flame is going to spread this morning. It may be that you came in here this morning and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Listen, I, if that's the case with you, I've got to lovingly warn you that if you leave this planet, if you leave this life not knowing Jesus as your Lord and Savior, there is an eternal fire in your future. But if today you'll accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you'll be saved from that eternal fire of hell and set eternally on fire from heaven. Amen? We're going to have a time of invitation in just a minute.
And I hope that today, I know you've heard the same gospel that they heard in the book of Acts that we read about. And their, their response was, men and brethren, what must we do? The answer then is the same as today. You must repent. You've got to quit going the way you're going because it leads to death. Turn from your sin that's killing you and turn to Jesus who offers everlasting life. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your goodness, for your mercy, for your grace, for your blood that covers us, for your fire that empowers us. And today, God, in this time of invitation, we just want to pray that there be one here today, God, who has never been set on fire of heaven. They've never taken Jesus as their Lord and Savior, that today will be the day that by walking to the front, Lord, they'll be saying to this whole congregation, I'm a sinner, I know it, but I know also that Jesus is the Son of God, and he came to, and he died for me. God, take this time of invitation, do with it what you would. We'll give you praise and glory for it all. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.